Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, just like it always happens in all uh, military forums, if during this presentation a crisis does take place, just remember, uh, don't panic. In five minutes, we will come back because the only thing I can anticipate is a power failure. I do not have power backup, full power backup. In case it does happen, you will probably have to give me two to three minutes for my internet to switch back. It has not happened in 33 talks from this computer at this location in the last few weeks. That I can assure you. Okay, Jai Hind to everyone. The time now is 6.20 and uh, I have 60 minutes to speak. I have 33 slides precisely. A challenging subject. Uh, thank you for putting me on a pedestal. It is, <laughs> you know, as a kind of inspiration and motivation I get from a network such as this, a very, very powerful network. I can make it out. I mean, seeing the personalities across, you can just make out how strong this network is. And let me, let me compliment you. Uh, what I'm trying to do myself, you are doing it in a multifarious way. You are networking and the power of networks, the power of compounding is much more than what a single individual can do. So hats off to you. You are doing exactly what I am trying to do in a very small way. That is spread strategic culture spread the knowledge of leadership and uh, i dare say today one of my other missions is to spread awareness on disaster management culture too when i was given the subject rather when you all chose this subject uh, i thought this was a it's, it's a very dynamic subject there's a lot which has happened in the past but i needed to give you something different something in a, in a slightly different format and look at it more futuristically. So uh, these are my perceptions. There are many, many things which may, you may not agree with and you should not agree with at all. The power of intellect comes from the, from the very simple the fact that you need not ever uh, accept what has just been presented to you. You have your mind and you will question it based upon your experience and your own knowledge. So we start and my compliments go out to my entire audience especially the younger one people who are listening to us here or watching us here. Uh, I dare say I've tried to make it as simple as possible. But uh, if I failed in that attempt, the, it is entirely my own fault because I am the, I'm the author of this and I am the person who's delivering it. So the, there's no one else who can be faulted for it. It starts mostly in the army. I love to start outside with a, a small salute to my own nation. You know, this kind of a photograph when you are in command in operational areas, this is a very common photograph when you salute your fallen comrades. And this photograph is taken from a wreath laying ceremony sometime in the year 2011 when a very large number of people from 15 core, we had, we lost a large number of people on, from 15 core in a, in a terrible avalanche up in Gurez. It didn't happen in enemy action, but in, in, a, in an avalanche and, and climatic conditions in Jammu and Kashmir, you know what they are aware of, what they are like. It also goes out that I like to start all my talks, dedicating them to the warriors of India who have made the supreme sacrifice in the service of the nation. This is one forum through which we can always remember them and we can always pass on this message to everyone that any anywhere you go, you start a talk. You're giving a lecture, you're an event, anything. Remember those who have enabled you to be able to continue doing what you are doing. Don't forget them. And I thought this is a good way to convey this. This will probably get embedded in the minds of our younger friends. So you saw the subject. It's about India's border security. It's about dual threats. It's about two, two borders, the western borders and the northern borders. But let me take you back. Let me take you back the last time the world got reset. You see, at the moment, we are going through a reset of geopolitics. But the last time it happened was 1989-90. That's the time when the Cold War came to an end. <clears throat> and uh, you find, found lots of things happening. India emerged in the year in 1989 to 1991. Lots of things happened in two years. Besides the conflict in Jabul Kashmir, which got initiated, you also found India 
taking major decisions to undergo a change in its economic policies. Today, if we are sitting on $520 billion worth of foreign exchange reserves, if we are the fastest growing economy of the world at 6.7%, it is primarily based on the decisions we took in 1989-1991. Lots of things were changing at that time. And internationally, if you see, just look at this, the rise of China to the center of global industrial growth. Today, China is coming down to 3 to 4% growth. It was the re-emergence of Europe as a massive integrated economic power that happened after the Industrial Revolution. There was the rise of middle powers, India, Brazil, China, South Africa, Russia, BRICS, all these middle powers were coming together, Indonesia, Australia, the IT revolution networks were proliferating, just about coming in into being. Ideological wars had started, although you may say that the Cold War itself was an ideological war, but ideological wars based upon religion, faith. The rise of political Islam was taking place. And for the next 30 years, political Islam would hold sway. The focus on democracy and human rights was suddenly finding its focus. So the world was undergoing a change in 1989-90. And if you're looking at change 30 years later, in 2022-23 onwards, this is what you should fall back on to understand how change will probably take place in the future. This is also the time when the rise of terror and hybrid war was taking. We talk about hybrid war when we come to it a little later. Ah, this is a problem here where I can't read my own slide. Yeah. So post Cold War, a confrontation between China and India was an expected phenomenon. It was said that two large powers in Asia perhaps could not survive together. So what was, what was the problem between India and China? We had gone to war in 1962. Thereafter, a bullet hadn't been fired. 1970, oh yes, sorry, 1967, we had gone to war. Virtual border clash in, in, at Nathula. 1975, we had, a, we had a bit of a standoff within the Assam Rifles and the PLA in Arunachal Pradesh, and we had lost four men there. But after 1975, we had not fired a shot at each other. The real problem between India and China is that both, both large nations have a very rich civilizational heritage. The Chinese believe that they are the ultimate, the Middle Kingdom, they are the ultimate, the most populous, both, both the countries, most populous countries have great potential, which is now being realized later after the colonial period. Their neighbors enjoy a large border between them. They are fearful of individual space being compromised, of either nation's space being compromised. And to that, trust deficit contributes the ideological differences between India and China. So China uses this trust deficit as a weapon. That, that is, it, it has, we have not been able to overcome despite the fact that we have come to $120 billion worth of trade. Or much of it is in favor of China. We have not been able to overcome this trust deficit. The support of Pakistan in a non-conventional threat environment. Of course, in a conventional threat environment, the whole Western border, the, 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 the uh, threat in being from Pakistan holds back a large segment of our forces. But in a non-conventional threat environment, also it is crucial for China. And the cultivation of India's neighborhood is inevitable if it wishes to dominate Asia and India. So it's not just a question of just the northern and the western border. It is also the maritime borders. It is also the borders with Bangladesh. It is also the borders with Nepal. And we have to therefore look at it from a multiple, a multi-border kind of angle. Now, uh, let me just take this out from here because this causes a bit of a problem. Yeah. The post-pandemic geopolitical reset is what we are talking about. You saw that uh, Mr. Modi is coming to power in 2014. Led us to approach China a little differently. And Mr. Modi very much in his expectations, in his enthusiasm for outreach to 
both the adversaries, Pakistan, you saw his his initial initial quiet and subsequently the actions that he took on the by even going off, going all the way to Afghanistan and from there making a dash to Lahore 25th of uh, December 2015. And the outreach which he did to President Xi Jinping brought a breath of fresh air at that time. But the responses you saw from both our adversaries were not the kind that we were expecting. And there were reasons for it. By 2019, when end of 2019, early 2020, the pandemic had set in and three years, geopolitics of the world underwent a change. Now we are in the post pandemic period and there's a post pandemic geopolitical reset, which is taking place. We have to understand this political reset to understand if there are border threats, if there are collusive border threats, which will continue to persist in the future. The first of the points is that the Ukraine war itself has upset the recovery of the post-pandemic reset. We were hoping that in the one to two years, uh, the world would be able to recover. That's not so. India is one of those fortunate countries which has come to 6.7% growth, despite the fact that we lost minus 24% in the first year um, of the pandemic. The Ukraine war has upset a tremendous amount in terms of economics and energy. Global terror has taken a back step. That's a positive thing. But will a second cycle emerge? Because if you remember, global terror, regional terror, it forms the half front. When you talk about the two and a half front wars, collusivity between Pakistan and China, the half front is always taken up by global terror and regional terror. There's chaos in the energy markets. Fortunately, we're looking at caps of $60 per barrel, but prices have gone up to $100 a barrel. And you saw cascading effects on, on the economy, economy of the world. The world economy is slowing, increased risk of this recession. New strategic groupings are expected, a North grouping, which is the Turkey, Iran, China, well, goes on that way. And you'll see the Southern grouping of the United States, Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, India, Australia, Japan. These are the kind of groupings that we are looking at. These were there pre-pandemic. These are expected to probably crystallize as we go along. The world GDP growth, expected to be between 1.5 and 3 percent expect china to be about 3.5 and 5 percent and india to be six percent or more will that be a reason will that be a reason for india being targeted for anything at all non-traditional security threats will root the security debate so far we have seen threats amounting to the use of military power the use of the ak-47 the use of missiles the use of well all kinds of weaponry and now the new kid on the block that is the drone so is that going to be the waves of the future or will security threats new kinds of security threats the non-traditional ones and i need not remind you that perhaps one of the biggest threats is going to be climate change cop cop 27 you saw what's happened in sham al sheikh no no agreement between the the, the, the various uh, uh, parties to the to the to the issue so what is the ways that are they going to be more pandemics Are the economics going to be the angle is energy going to be the weapon china's post pandemic path and ability to control internal dissension a lot was being read into it in the last few days this is one of the few things which will also play a major role so as far as south asia is concerned Sri Lanka, Pakistan and Bangladesh are all challenged that the cost of food and energy has also gone up. India is the only bright spot in South Asia. So is uh, the positivity about India, is this, is this message of positivity about India likely to draw greater attention and make it the focus of negativity from our adversaries? It's a golden opportunity for India to win back influence in South Asia and neutralize China. Remembering the fact that 20 years, 25 years ago, China decided to use the doctrine of the very famous, if you remember, the string of pearls. A lot of people have disputed it, that it was never really a doctrine. But if you just assume it, that it was a doctrine, it perhaps was a strategy which China was using to cultivate influence in India's neighborhood. Is it the golden opportunity for India to win back influence in South Asia and neutralize China? What should our policy be for that? 
it is also an equal opportunity for china to reactivate all that it had drawn down upon uh, as far as cultivating influence in south asia was concerned in a competitive world with a young population and dynamic human capital, India has all the potential to grow beyond the threshold of being a middle power. We are being classified as a middle power. Yes, we are proud of the fact that India has gone beyond just a emerging power. It is a, it's a middle power if you go by various definitions. This, this definition of being a middle power and going beyond the threshold of a middle power, this is what worries the Chinese. This is what worries the Pakistan. Because both are neighbors, and India is in a very crucial geopolitical location. Of course, Pakistan also occupies that such a position as we'll come to it subsequently. But this is what worries the Chinese. So 30 years after the Cold War, the world was anyway moving towards a geopolitical reset. 2019, to my mind, five years after the coming of the current Indian leadership, six years after the coming of uh, Xi Jinping, uh, I, I think a political reset was inevitably taking place when the COVID pandemic came and gave it an impetus. Some of the bullets which you look here, look at out here, there was a depletion of US power which was taking place and the rapid rise of China with the enhanced ambition of its leadership. 2017, if you see um, the 19th Congress and the way it had set out the, uh, the milestones, 2049, and we were looking at uh, the permanent leadership of Xi Jinping. We were looking at 2035, and Xi Jinping would be 82 years old, something like Mao Zedong. Um, and by 2035, China was being able to was hoping that it could achieve much of what Xi Jinping would leave behind as uh, his his uh, uh, you know the, the 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 effects of his leadership on China and the world. The resurgence of Russia was taking place, a relative cooling of transnational terror, which I just spoke about. The freedom of navigation and existence of a rule-based order was coming under challenge, which is what China was doing. Uh, China itself, knowing that its powers existed primarily towards the Pacific, which were always under challenge by the United States, it did not have the capability of a blue water navy to be able to rule the roost of the Indian Ocean. For that, it had to wait. It probably has to wait for a long time. And the importance of environment and climate was now really coming into being with, you know, Glasgow and before that other COP conferences which had taken place. And you're seeing what is happening in Pakistan this year, 30 to 40 billion dollars which have been lost by the floods in the, in the Indus River itself. A nation when looking for $9 billion loans loses 30 to $40 billion worth of damages and has 2.3 billion million refugees being created. You can imagine the internal security problem which comes about to do uh, occurrence such as that. So this is what the image, this is what the environment of 2019 was. It is almost similar to what 2022-23 now is. The, 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 the coronavirus pandemic has given it an impact uh, and a bit of a boost and that's how the whole situation is now panning out the u.s desire is to shift the strategic center of gravity from the middle east from this area of afghanistan eurasia and take it to the indo-pacific where it feels that the not so peaceful rise of china is something that it will have to confront. But uh, this is something which has been pending since the 90s and could now be a major driver. The, eff the effort could, toward, could be much more serious towards this. This is what President Biden was playing with when he took his decisions to leave Afghanistan at any cost on 31st of August 2021. Much to the to the reputation of the United States Armed Forces. But within six months, you found 24th of February, the United States was drawn into the proxy war in Ukraine. And for all that they wanted to move to the Indo-Pacific, the, the, the focus has come back to Europe, to an area which they never expected that it would come to, and possibly may cascade into Eurasia and even into the Middle East. So that brings us with this background 
it brings us to this map. And uh, on this map, military people will probably be able to talk for hours. <laughs> uh, I wish to talk only for a couple of minutes on this to draw attention to a few things. You know, uh, a military mind looks at a map and starts drawing conclusions when he sees lines drawn all over boundaries and things like that. The issues which come to mind here immediately, number one, let's look at Pakistan, just a second. Let's look at Pakistan and we will, because Pakistan is one country which is geopolitically challenged and yet highly privileged, highly privileged. So whenever we look at such a map, I always turn to Pakistan first. Pakistan is a country which is surrounded by, with neighbors, five civilizations. No country in the world has got five civilizations. Let's count them. It's got the Indian civilization. It's got the Chinese civilization. It's got the Central Asian civilization, the Persian civilization, and the Arab civilization. No country in the world has five civilizations around. If you look at it from this angle, a civilizational angle, something to give to, a, to all these civilizations, something to take back. For example, an access into Central Asia, the unrealized hydrocarbon um, deposits here, to take out oil and gas from here, the easiest and the cheapest route is through Pakistan or Iran. Iran is geopolitically challenged because of its situation at the moment and its relationship with the only superpower. So it is Pakistan which rules the roost. And therefore, anything which has to come out from Central Asia has to come out through Pakistan. For example, the Tapi, uh, the famous pipeline, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline, which will meet India's 25% of India's gas reserves. But no, Pakistan doesn't allow it. Because it knows that it is, it will be to the advan economic advantage of India. So, you see Pakistan, that's the favor it can do here, but it will not do. For China, the biggest thing for China that Pakistan can do is to give it overland access to the Arabian Sea, the north east western part of the Indian Ocean, the crucial area of the waterways here. Yesterday, I was at a book launch. And then I was asked to speak for 5-10 minutes on Ukraine. And the one thing which I told my audience there was, why is this war being fought in, over you, in Ukraine? And I explained to them this is being fought by the Russians for one prime reason. This is because of the waterways. Because if, if Russia loses control of the Black Sea, the only other control Russia has got to the sea is from Vladivostok here in the Pacific Ocean. Or, or, or to the Arctic Ocean, the Arctic Seas here on top of the Arctic Ocean, which are anyway frozen. The only place from where it can make an access into the warm waters is from the Black Sea here. And if you remember 2015, China went into Syria, or sorry, Russia went into Syria. For what reason? To protect and defend its port of Latakia. Because without that port, its access into the Mediterranean and this very important crucial belt would be not possible at all. So just remember that. Lots and lots of things are based upon waterways. The Chinese want to make access here. Why? China achieved 14% growth at one time. Overheated economy. It could only happen for because of two reasons. It had full access to the hydrocarbons of the Middle East, which came from along the route of the Indian Ocean through the Straits of Malacca and in on to the eastern seaboard where Shenzhen and other areas of Hong Kong where manufacturing was, was carried out. Manufacturing brought China into the sway and the 14% growth could be achieved because of that. Right? Now, what the Chinese have always feared is that if one country develops its, its maritime capability to the optimum level, and that is India, then the Indian Ocean will never be safe enough for the movement of Chinese energy traffic, nor its goods traffic. Because all the manufactured items go by container traffic, container ships, 
through the same routes to Africa, to Middle East, to the markets in India, to Europe. That's how the economy of China came about. And this is China's biggest fear. If you, talk, if you reflect back to trust deficit, China's trust deficit comes because of this. It suspects that one day India will rise, it will be instigated, it will create a maritime capability so powerful that the Chinese, that it will be able to interfere with the movement of the Chinese goods and energy traffic. It needs, therefore, overland sea routes. And those overland sea routes are through Pakistan, the inevitable China-Pakistan economic corridor. And now the emerging Iran-China relationship, because the same routes can go through Tajikistan, Turkmenistan into Iran. So this is the importance, once again, of, of Pakistan. There are many other things like this. Just want to remember one thing. One of the ways that China has found to ensure that India does not pay balanced attention or does not pay sufficient attention to its maritime capability is through one strategy. And that is keep India activated on the Himalayan front. Keep the threats on the, on the land borders so intense and active that the gullible Indian public, the gullible Indian strategic community will always say no loss of land, no loss of ground. Bhaad mein jaye sea, bhaad mein jaye ocean, but we must not lose any land. Right? This is a ploy that the Chinese have used against our minds. Psychological warfare. And from 2005, every year, a walk-in operation. What is a walk-in operation? Come, come to a certain part of Ladakh, come and leave a flag behind, leave a few tins of, of fish or fruit or something to say, this is my land, go back. And it plays on your adversary's mind that this is disputed territory. And because of that, one day we may have to go to war with China. And therefore, we need a mountain strike corps. We need this, we need that, we need more resources. And we continue putting all our eggs into one basket on the land borders. While the threat actually exists somewhere else. Now, this, this, this has been very successfully done by, by the Chinese, uh, playing mind games into us. Fortunately, India's strategic community today is coming of age and has realized this. And this is something that the future leaderships will have to, have to overcome. This, uh, this inevitable obsession with our land borders, loss of ground, loss of territory, etc. Not realizing that our capability lies there deep south, all along the Indian Ocean. That's why this ocean is called the Indian Ocean. Anyway, we can speak on this for hours. So I thought I must just tell you the broad item areas of pa for Pakistan. Pakistan is the confluence of civilizations. It is the bridge between West Asia to South Asia. It is more comfortable being Arab than South Asian. It, is, it's, it gives you access to the heart of Asia. It also gives reverse access to the Indian Ocean. And it flanks Shia Iran. So it becomes an inevitable partner of the Saudis, although its relationship with Saudi Arabia isn't as warm as it was in the earlier years. And it considers Afghanistan territory as a strategic depth. And strangely, the relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan today is also heading towards coming into doldrums. So it's a very awkward kind of a situation which is emerging at the moment, much to the advantage of India. Few things let me just try and explain you here on this board. Although let me tell you, I may not be able to complete all my 34 slides in the one hour, but whatever we do, it achieve a lot because this particular map is a map which will explain a tremendous amount to you. This is Jammu and Kashmir. The whole of Jammu and Kashmir is represented here. But most people will not remember how, what is the actual status of this today. And General Duvedi, the Army Commander, Northern Command's recent statement that if the government gives us orders, we will be ready to take back Pakistan occupied Kashmir. It has created a shindy all over. I had to go public to defend the Army Commander myself and say all he was talking of was a contingency. There was nothing political in what he said uh, at all. And, uh, and, and army officers, senior army officers, or once in a while, must make these media statements. And they must send across these messages to your adversary. 
So that is why I thought it's important for us to explain this. Now just remember, you just follow my cursor. The whole of Jammu and Kashmir, the actual portion which is with us at the moment is only this green line, this purple line, and up to this area here. This is all that is with us. The rest of it, Pakistan occupied Kashmir here, the Gilgit Baltistan area, and this whole area is generically called Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Right? This is Aksai Chin, which is under the control of China. And uh, this is uh, the area of the Shaksgam Valley, which was ceded by Pakistan to China for the construction of the Karakoram Highway, which got finally constructed only way back in 1979. So, there are certain borders here, which you need to know about. What are these borders? The first of them is the international border. If you see the cursor here, no disputes here. It's called the international border. Pakistan likes to call it the working boundary, not the international border. They think there's a finality to this border, which has to be yet settled. While we are clear, there's nothing at all which has to be settled. The important part is this pink line or the purple line, which starts from here, which is about 770 kilometers up to here. Uh, up to a point called NJ9842. This is the line of control. What is the line of control? That's the place where the two armies came to rest in 1947 48, in 1965, and in 1971. Right? As is where is, it is demarcated on ground, it is delineated on ground. Under the Suchetgarh Agreement, there's a signature of General P.S. Bhagat on the map, authenticated. Right? So, there is a distinct line to work upon. That's an important aspect. At 9842, from 9842 up to a place called Indra Kaul, is a 121 kilometers imaginary line, not delineated, is called the actual ground position line, also called the AGPL 121 kilometers, which actually virtually demarcates the Siachen Glacier. Right? Not, not officially, but virtually, Dimakis to Siachen Glacier. So that's where Siachen is. I happen to have commanded my unit at the Siachen Glacier. Now here comes the area of Siachen, of Aksaichen. These red lines you're seeing here, our perception of the LAC is this, should be this. China's perception of the LAC is this, line of actual control. There are a lot of difference between the LAC and the LOC. This, this line is neither demarcated nor delineated and keeps changing as per perception. China give, gives its perception every other day. From 1993 till 2022, in 21 meetings, China has never ever given us what the, its actual perception of the line of actual control is. That is a weapon by itself. Keeping your adversary, in this case, we are the adversary of China, keeping the adversary guessing, kya hai, line kaha hai, map kaun se map par hai, kis map pe kaha se darar pad rahi hai, all this is information, keeping you in the information, outside the information loop, and not resolving the problem, because China does not want a resolution of this problem. If China resolves this problem, it will free up India's northern borders. And India will have the capability to go in for a much more comprehensive kind of a security setup, looking at its air force and looking at its naval power in a much more focused way. Today, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm from the army, proud to wear the green uniform. But let me tell you today, we are an army focused armed forces, ground focused, land focused. Primarily because of our obsession with land. Zameen ke saath. Sar zameen ke saath. That is what our obsession is today. Okay. So th these are important aspects to remember. Now, just remember also. Ek chiz aapko yaad honi chahiye. Everyone should know this. I am taking you back. I am drawing your attention to this portion. This is the G219 highway. This is the highway which links... Tibet to Xinjiang, North May. And it passes through the it passes through this area of Aksai Chin, which is Indian, actually belongs to us. The Chinese have constructed this highway illegally. 
and to give themselves depth, they want to keep this area occupied by their occupation, the LAC, so that we cannot interfere with the movement on this highway. That is the prime reason why the Chinese are all the time in this area and do not wish to vacate this. Ethan, just remember this much. It's very, very simple. Also, this, this particular map may be able to explain to you just how close Siachen Glacier is to the Karakoram Pass, Dalat Bay Oldi. This is where this is where this is the Aksai chain area. This is the under Dalat Bay Oldi is with us, but this is the area occupied by the Chinese. And you can see how much the distance is. Those who say today that Siachen Glacier should be vacated by India should think about this particular gap here. Because if India overcates the Siachen Glacier, this area has to be occupied by China and Pakistan to get continuity. I agree that the, the terrain is terrible, terrible, terrible out here. But yes, continuity is still possible. These are some of the other areas along the Sino-Indian border where disputes exist. The McMahon Line in Arunachal Pradesh. You have a dock lamb here, which you have had a standoff with China. You've got disputed areas along Uttarakhand and uh, the Himachal border here. And of course, then you've got Ladakh, the whole area of Ladakh and the Shakskam Valley. Now, you may recall 5th of August 2019, when the Article 370 was, uh, um, you know, am amended, which was amended, not really removed, it was amended. And on 31st October, we published this map. Showing the whole of Ladakh, there's an Aksai chain here, Shaksgam Valley here, Gilgit Baltistan here, the whole of Ladakh in blue, and the whole of Pakistan occupied Kashmir, which includes the areas of Mirpur, Muzaffarabad, Kotli, etc., all shown in yellow or gold. This was to send home the message that the whole of Jammu and Kashmir belongs to India, as per the instrument of accession signed on 26th of October 1947. And reinforced on 22nd of February 1994 by a joint parliamentary resolution with all parties coming together, both houses of parliament coming together to pass a resolution that every inch of territory ceded by the Maharaja of Kashmir to the Union of India under the instrument of accession belongs to India and we will strive to get it back. This map is very important. It's a cartographic message to the world that Jammu and Kashmir belongs to India. So as the pandemic struck the world and India too, the Chinese PLA chose to up the ante against India on the line of actual control in April 2020. Just at the time when you, all of us are struggling with the first wave, that's the time when you suddenly saw the news in the morning newspapers that April 2020, and this was discovered more in May of 2020, that the Chinese have brought in 50,000 troops against us. Why? What was the reason for it? That's important. The standoff continues even after 16 rounds of military meetings and partial withdrawals, which have taken place since uh, 2020. So let's look at the China Man syndrome. What really forced them? What really forced them to do it? The 1962 border war and the China Man syndrome. This is what is important to just remember. From 62, we were defeated. Okay. We came to the Nathula incident in which we, it was a border standoff. We caused a huge amount of casualties, particularly through artillery, on the Chinese at Nathula, refused to budge. General Sagat Singh undertook all his decisions and was reinforced by the government. We stood our ground and proved that uh, 62 would have just been an aberration. Therefore, nothing much happened. In 1978, China started undergoing a change. Four modernizations came into being. Deng Xiaoping brought about the four modernizations. Four modernizations, just as a reminder, was nothing but the industrial modernization of agriculture, industry, technical education, and fourth, modernization of the PLA. Now, in the modernization of the PLA, the Chinese made one, one major mistake, and it's important for an audience like you to know this mistake. The mistake that the Chinese made was that they gave the last priority to the PLA Navy. They gave first priority to the PLA Army, that's the People's Liberation Army, then to the Air Force, and then to the Navy. 
They thought, like much of the world thinks that the Navy, naval power is only for trade. Not realizing that a, the requirement of a blue water Navy would have given China the major advantage today. They are 20 years behind the United States. 15 modern aircraft new carriers which the United States has got. China has got three of them today. So, uh, this is one of the major mistakes that Deng made or the Chinese made at that time. Subsequently, of course, they made, uh, we had the incident of Sundarong Chu in 1986-87 when India stood its ground again in Arunachal Pradesh, led to Rajiv Gandhi's 1988 visit uh, to, to Beijing and subsequently the signing of the Peace and Tranquility Agreement in 1993, based upon which various instruments, various platforms were set up where just rounds of talks, 21 talks, rounds of talks particularly were held to no avail. So the, the impasse of 2020 was a result of some of the following assessments which I have made. The first was a rapid change in the geopolitical environment with the COVID-19 pandemic having broken out. The world was pointing fingers at China. Just like today, China seems to be the only country which is obsessed with lockdown. They feel that they have their own ways of doing things. In 2019, in December, people like me, I'm not sure about you, but people like me, who are being very, very naive, we said, Anedo, let the virus come to India. India's 42 degrees centigrade will destroy the virus. I mean, that's the kind of things we were talking about in those days. Not realizing this pandemic would put us back by minus 24% as far as our economy was concerned. Then China had its Doklam image deficit. You remember 2017, they finally, after 72 days, they withdrew. And the reason for it was because the BRICS summit was coming up, the 20th and the 19th Congress was coming up for the Chinese Communist Party. And they couldn't afford to have a standoff taking place on the borders. And therefore, they felt that an image deficit had been created about China's image. And they must overcome this through some kind of a military action against India. Curbing India's runaway strategic confidence after the Article 370 abrogation. This event, these events in April took place, well, how much? Eight months after uh, the, the 5th of August decisions. And we made some strong statements, perhaps in Parliament. We had made some strong sentiments, uh, statements in the media. The Indian media, you know, goes overboard. And we, we, we sent out a message as if we had, uh, despite the Chinese, despite the Pakistanis, the world can say what they want. Kashmir belongs to India and we will take our decisions again. The Chinese wanted to perhaps send home some kind of a message. The strategic messaging to the world on China's new ambition, premier power by 2035, in the lifetime of Xi Jinping. Now, taking advantage of the downturn in the US comprehensive national power, which was evident, which was taking place every day, we were seeing how the pandemic was hitting the United States and hitting the US economy in particular. The Chinese seemed to have got a little carried away. So what was China's, India's strategy in April 2020? Number one, the Wuhan virus. They wanted to remove this label of the Wuhan virus and bring back the focus onto something more geopolitical. The image deficit had to be overcome. Wolf warrior diplomacy was being attempted against a larger nation. It was attempted against Hong Kong within itself, within its own country, against Philippines. It had been tried against Australia. It had been tried against Vietnam, the fishing boat incidents which were taking place there. So perhaps it was an experiment to see will wolf warrior diplomacy actually work against a rising middle power. Of course, I spoke about the Doklam image and keeping India, as I mentioned earlier, reinforcing that perception of mine, keeping India focused to the Himalayan front. The main threat to China is in the maritime zone. And China realizes it. His cultivation of Sri Lanka, his cultivation of the Maldives, his necessity to keep the Indo Northeast Indian Ocean under control, the Djibouti to Chabahar area, that area, all under its influence, is very, very important. Continuing with China's India strategy, worried by the improved Indian capability, it won't resolve the LAC, nor will it delineate it. Keeping the LAC in a state of dispute works to the advantage of China. And to do that, enhanced collusion with Pakistan. To 
give the impression, a perception to India and the world that the second arm of the Belt and Road Initiative, the first arm going through, you know, the northern areas in Gilgit, Baltistan, which are not so firm areas, very earthquake prone, etc. The second arm of the Belt and Road Initiative would come through Ladakh. That is, through perhaps, uh, perhaps through the, the Leh Valley itself, or it could come through the Nubra Valley and head into, into Gilgit, Baltistan, but alternative ways. And it perceives India to be an obstacle in its path to greatness. This, as I said, uh, is, is the whole aspect of the trust deficit. So, if you really look at it, Ladakh is the area where dual, dual threats, where, uh, China, where Pakistan can actually come to the assistance of China in a huge way. Of course, China can conduct operations in Arunachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, or anywhere else, and yet have the Pakistan, Pakistanis, Pakistan army making faces from across the Western Front and tying down a sizable uh, number of our reserves there. But the place where this act comes into physicality is actually the area of Jammu and Kashmir where operations can be undertaken in the side chain area and you can see its linkages that's why i thought i'd show you this whole map to see this is kargil this is kargil this is the area of kashmir this side and this is kargil which is also part of ladakh so operations by pakistan can take place here although difficult to conduct these operations because pakistan has to swing around its logistics all the way here but nevertheless the presence of pakistan army here forces us to keep a large size of a number of our troops in this area and while Chinese, the Chinese are conducting operations in the Aksai chain area. See, this is the linkages which I wanted to show you, which I've already explained to you in some way. Dalat Beg Oldies, Siachen Glacier. This, this is the new road, 320 kilometer road, which took a long time to construct, but it's very, very difficult terrain. This is the Pengongso, small sliver of territory of the Pengongso. So, uh, just to explain this, large, uh, the dynamics of the situation at the border. First of all, May, May 2020, if the Chinese came with 60,000 troops, it took us two months to build up 60,000 troops. And I think the Indian Air Force needs to be complemented for the manner in which the strategic airlift was conducted. Very large quantum of armor has been delivered into that area. Uh, you couldn't, I, I could not have imagined that this amount of air vehicles could find their way into the, into the desert areas of, uh, across the Ladakh range in, 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 Leh, in Ladakh. The Kailash Heights in the area of the Pengongso were secured as a quid pro quo by us. Now they have been vacated. It was good thinking, quick thinking, must complement the commanders at, of, at that time. Uh, it happened on 31st of August. The Chinese occupation uh, of those areas took place in April, early May. It took the better part of three months for us to gain strategic balance, I would say operational balance, uh, before we could conduct an operation. And this operation was a QPQ in which a shot was not fired. No shot was fired, but this area was still unoccupied. We went and secured. If you use, see, I use the word secured and not captured. The Indian Air Force advantage, we have got a great advantage of the Indian Air Force in this area. And any good flyer will explain you this. Uh, it's a question of the heights from which we, our aircraft take off with their all up uh, uh, weight. They gave full, full uh, munitions available to them. The Chinese, most of the airfields are at 14, 15,000 feet, and that advantage is not there. But uh, they have a missile advantage. They have a larger missile, missile forces uh, available to them. Uh, and that is something which we have to build upon much more. The winter logistics is a major challenge. It's much easier on the Chinese side because there's a plain flat area. Ours is right from Pathan Court, through Manali, all the way to Leh, or through Srinagar, through Kargil, all the way to Leh is nothing but up and down, climbing up to 15,000, 16,000 feet and down and climbing up again. Uh, it's a major challenge. Just, just as a practical orientation, one vehicle leaving Pathan Court, and going to, let's say, to Leh, will take at least 10 to 12 days to come back. 
that's the amount of time one vehicle you can imagine how much how my how many vehicles you require just to be able to uh dump your loads and you need thousands and ton, thousands of tons of loads we are fortunate we have got a strategic airlift capability today with the air force otherwise it is impossible to fight a war in the past So the LOC type deployment on the LEC is partially avoided. It's been done. China requires many more troops for campaign style operations. 60,000 troops, you can't capture Ladakh, let me tell you. Let's be very clear on this. If they brought 60,000 troops to show us and our public that they are going to defeat the Indian army and capture Ladakh, then the PLA should go back and um, learn lessons from Putin perhaps. Go back and look at Ukraine. They also, everyone thought that it would be a overnight operation taking place in Ukraine. And you see the operations are going on till today, right? So matching mirror-like of mirror-like deployments of sixty thousand troops don't lead to major campaign-style victories. Neither uh, military diplomatic talks are are continuing, and these are a means of stalling. I am very clear in my mind; these are a means of stalling and nothing else. No results are likely to come from. So what should we expect over the next three years? And I'm coming to the Pakistan part, which I'm only devoting 10 minutes to. What should one expect over the next three years? China is watchful after Russia's Ukraine experience. This is the first bullet I'm looking at. Military victory is beyond military superiority. Don't just think that I'm mili militarily superior, so I will win the war. No, that's no longer possible. You've got to look at it more comprehensively. China is also concerned about India's strategic confidence under Prime Minister Modi. A stalemate at the high Himalayas will be perceived as an Indian victory. Therefore, the Chinese are unlikely to initiate something which they cannot end on their terms. Conflict initiation must end with conflict termination on your terms. Diversion from Taiwan is unlikely. Yet the threat in being will be projected. If anything which uh, Ukraine has achieved is, is to put caution into the minds of China. That Taiwan may not is easily be winnable. Remember, the power of the, the Quad is not a military coalition, but remember the coalitions which can be put up in the Indo-Pacific probably outweigh China many times over. They are wary of India's strategic autonomy. The autonomy that we have achieved, particularly during this Ukrainian crisis. And uh, they are aware that they cannot point fingers at India diplomatically either. Because India has played its own game, it's played its own mind. India has not blindly supported the United States, neither has it blindly supported the Russians. And in fact, Mr. Modi's statement at the SCO summit on this not being the season for war is uh, a, a phrase which will should probably go down in history and will probably need to be analyzed much more. I don't think it's been analyzed sufficiently thus far. And active propaganda, very, very active propaganda, information warfare, the, the weapon of the, of the current times should be expected. And what's happened at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences is a precursor to lots of things which are going to happen to us in the near future. So if we are not looking at the cyber route, then this is something that we need to do much more. Let me come to Pakistan and I will finish this in 10 minutes to make sure that we have the duality of threats together. What are the drivers of conflict with Pakistan today? It, one of the biggest things to my mind is the Pakistan sentiment for retribution. Retribution for what? 1971. It's something the Pakistan army has not got over. And if you sit down with Pakistani generals in track twos, I have attended 30 of these track twos. When you sit down with Pakistani generals, the perception you come away with is that Pakistan still continues to believe that they have not lost the 71 war. They only lost Bangladesh. <laughs> they lost East Pakistan, but they did not lose the war. They said that war, it, it was an uneven war created by India in such a way. This is what they talk about. The Islamic Connect, you see the Islamic Connect is a very important aspect. They hope that through the Islamic Connect, they keep India under pressure 
They keep the Indian Muslim population under pressure. They keep going back to the, to the OIC to put the region under pressure. So the Islamic connection is a very important aspect here. The role of political Islam overall, this needs a, this needs a, a session by itself to explain. The waters issue, the Indus waters particularly. And Pakistan is a country which is going to suffer from the water problem inevitably over the next many years and the control of waters of China of Pakistan still continue to be with India. The China factor and the connectivity I've already explained. The winds from Afghanistan, the winds from Afghanistan blowing. Pakistan doesn't have control of Afghanistan and Pakistan does not want India to take control of Afghanistan. It is already grimacing under the fact that India-Taliban relations are already improving actually. And then there's the Pakistani deep state, which I just spoke about the Pakistani generals who do not want to leave control. You've seen what uh, General Bajwa has retired with, 12, 14 billion rupees in the accounts, they say. And of course, lastly, the rising strategic confidence of India. If Pakistan feels that this strategic confidence will continue, then all the last 30 years investment in Jammu and Kashmir, in causing you know, mayhem and dismay in the rest of India, all that has gone waste. So, the important aspect is, will, the, will there be a military intent? Will the internal turbulence which is going on in Pakistan today, will it curb its external ambition? Does it, do, do we feel that with the, with, the, with the $12 billion foreign exchange reserves that they have got with them, the economy in shambles completely, but Pakistan, despite all that is happening in the internal security front, in the internal political front, it will want to still continue its mission in Jammu and Kashmir and rest of India, etc. That's the moot point. And for that, I could take you to the most important slide, I would say, of this whole presentation. This is the strategy which Ziaul Haq conceived. In way back in 1977, when he overthrew the when he overthrew Zulfikar Bhutto, clearly Pakistan is unable to match India's conventional army, nor its economic strength to achieve any retribution for 71. Very clear, economically Pakistan cannot match, conventional army it cannot match. It is necessary to achieve nuclear parity to overcome this asymmetry. They did it. They did it by hook or by crook. They went and achieved nuclear parity and then launch a war by a thousand guns with the support a tacit support of the oic that the islamic community 57 countries of the oic they haven't got the support of all 57 countries but from time to time they've got a majority support and well jammu and kashmir has been discussed the role uh, the status of Mus indian muslims has been discussed many times in the oic as we are aware but what is important is the decision to launch a hybrid war. Lots of hybrid wars have been, have been launched the world over. The last very successful hybrid war was launched by the Russians in Crimea, in Donbass. From 2014 till 2022, a hybrid war was launched. A hybrid war is what? It's a war of the millennium. It combines various parts of the spectrum of conflict. Part conventional, part irregular, part terrorism and part cyber. Narcotics involved, economics involved, political warfare, ideology, transnational crime riding on the networks created by Daoud Ibrahim, violent extremism, psychological warfare, war by communication, bits and pieces of the spectrum. You don't have to use all of them. Pick up bits and pieces from here and there, combine them together, optimize them for yourself. So today's master strategists know how to optimize hybrid warfare. It provides flexibility, longevity, and can only be defeated by a full spectrum all of government approach. And an all of government approach takes many years to be realized and that many more years to be executed as we are realizing in Jammu and Kashmir today. So the best example of hybrid war, Russian efforts in Ukraine from 2014 onwards. Now I'm coming to the end. Allow me um, five minutes more. I think uh, we'll be able to, to wrap up this. Uh, what really are, what was India's success and failure against Pakistan? 
it's important for us to just know where the failures have taken. We have, we have we've been very successful in reducing the strength of terrorists. There has been no dearth of courage on the part of our soldiers, of our policemen. The problem is our last mile syndrome. Never understood. Limited, limited initiatives have been taken place. And uh, very, very poor understanding of our cultural terrain. Over-reliance on kinetics. Unfortunately, this is not an, it's not an Indian approach to world over. The whole issue of terror and the use of terror, the use of irregular warfare, inevitably the response was an over-reliance on kinetics. It's necessary sometimes, but it must be accompanied at the earliest by a better understanding of the cultural terrain of the location in which you are fighting. This has not taken place as far as we are concerned. We also have not bothered sufficiently to understand the, kind, the, the, the cultural terrain of Jammu and Kashmir, for example. Weak strategic communication, the inability to get, for example, Jammu and Kashmir regions on the same plate. Efforts have not been made, sufficient efforts have not been made. Why? Strategic communication is the, one of the most important arms of fighting irregular warfare. The lack of political will to peg Indian, the Indian claim strongly. We are seeing this now happening. 2019 onwards, we are seeing this happening. And now these a statement from time to time coming from the Raksha Mantri, from the Army Commander, Northern Command, etc., GOC 15 Corps, that POK, if the, if the orders are given, we will take it back, etc. This is a good psychological buildup, I would say. It's a good psychological buildup, and this is a good messaging which is going on for the moment. It shows that we have overcome those mi conventional mindsets that we were obsessed with in the past. A very high degree of strategic confidence has defined Pakistan's pursuance of its national interests. In fact, there's always been a level of cockiness about it. As I was explaining to you, the Pakistani generals tell me they have never lost the 71 war. So, Pakistan's national interests, you can see, I think I've explained these already and I need not go into them. Finally, so finally, what are the takeaways from this? From this long one-hour monologue which I have given you and which I may have bored you to death completely. But let me tell you, the takeaways are very important here. There is an India-China asymmetry. Don't expect lasting peace. It won't happen. What we are doing at the moment is negotiations to create a temporary set of measures to find peace at our borders. But the asymmetry continues and we must endeavor to overcome this asymmetry. There is no option for India but to ramp up its economy, its military modernization, and its cyber domain. Very, very important. Its enhanced maritime capability and overcome its obsession with its land borders. We need to long-range missiles, nuclear weapons, etc. Everything, every aspect of weaponry must be looked into. Both nations can do business as usual. We can take our trade from $120 billion to $200 billion. Contingent upon China's attitude. India must work towards a clear strategic partnerships. We cannot say that we are alone. We need to just confront China alone. We must continue working towards clear strategic partnerships. Being a part of uh, the Quad or any other partnerships in the Indo-Pacific is should be an inevitability, inevitability, absolutely. And India must keep Pakistan on strategic tenderness. We must not think in terms of Pakistan being run down because of circumstances, because of uh, the threat of climatic conditions, etc. But we must also remember that an imploding Pakistan, 200 million population of Pakistan implodes, the effects of that, the demographic effects of that will inevitably travel on India. India must match China's information and cyber capability. This is an area where we are still wanting. We need to do this much more seriously. And finally, finally, let any subsequent COVID waves be handled like war. Medical infrastructure be developed as never before. I think the government of India has done well on this. But any amount that we do on medical from now onwards, we must realize that pandemics 
can do much more against economies than wars can. And therefore, these must be treated as wars. Work amicably in cooperation with the international community, accept faults, if any, and endeavor to help others. Maintain vigil in all security domains, borders, internal, cyberspace, information, and financial. That means comprehensive security. Invest in technical research and startups to create a manufacturing base. Invest in education. Current challenges of higher education are immense. And work on poverty alleviation. Remember the Chinese lifted 750 million people out of poverty. And then they could start make, looking at the world and making eyes at it. Remember this lesson. India must be a lead nation. It should not be a balancing nation. It's a very important statement. It must be a lead nation and not a balancing nation. Thank you very much.